Good morning, everybody, and welcome to New Covenant House. As you can see this morning, I am speaking to you from my house in Parker, Texas, and that is because of inclement weather. You know, we've all heard the forecast. Well, I hope we've heard the forecast that over the next few days, from Saturday into Monday, the weather is going to be, I'm sorry, into Wednesday, the weather is going to be pretty bad. So I want to encourage all of us to please be careful on the road, stay safe, stay warm. Amen. And with that, I want to say, Happy Valentine's Day, folks. That's right. For those folks who forgot, particularly the married men, today is Valentine's Day. And unfortunately, in Dallas, the weather is too bad. So you can't dash to Kroger as you usually do to get flowers. So basically, you're in trouble. Yeah? Well, good luck. <laughs> and, and because, you know, love is in the air, right? We thought it would be a good time to talk about a few things that pertain to love and relationships. This week, I will be talking about dating. And I want us to turn our Bibles very quickly to the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 22, and I will read from the New Living Translation. The Bible says, The man who finds a wife finds a treasure, and he receives favor from the Lord. Now, I have read these verses many times, and I have heard it preached many times. I've actually preached from it a few times. But most times, the focus has been on the finding on how to find or, or how to be found or who is supposed to do the finding. Is it the man who does the finding or the woman who does the finding? Is it okay to ask a guy out on a date and all of those things? But this morning, I want to look at two words in this verse, the word man and the word wife. Please note that God is intentional. The words in this Bible are not an accident. God does not talk carelessly. He uses words in order to convey to us his heart. And his heart says, the man that finds a wife. Please note, it doesn't say the boy who finds a girl, like the, 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 the romantic comedy uh, uh, movies, the boy meets girl. No, it says the man who finds a wife. And it doesn't say the male who finds a female finds a good thing. It doesn't say the boy who finds a girlfriend or fiancé or the boyfriend or fiancé who finds a girlfriend or fiancé. The verse says, the verse says, the man who finds a wife. That means in order to have a relationship, in order to have a, a relationship that leads to marriage, we need a man and a wife. Now these words man and wife are not speaking about gender. They are talking about stages in development, amen, spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially, financially, personally. They are talking about the level of a person's maturity. And they are certainly not talking about age because you can be 60 years old and not be a man. You can be 70 years old and not be a wife. The question that I want you to ask yourself this morning is, am I a man? Am I mature enough to be called a man? Yes, I have a beard. But does that make me a man? Am I a wife? Yes, I can cook. Yes, I can, I can clean. But does that make me a wife? I know I am male, but am I a man? I know I am female, but am I a wife? Now, the reason why this question is important is that marriage is a complex and sometimes difficult relationship. There are days when it is the most beautiful thing on earth. And there are days when you and your spouse are, are practically about to off each other. And I know somebody here is thinking, well, I know a bunch of boys or, or a bunch of girls who got married, they were mature and they're doing okay. First of all, the goal is not to be just okay. And second of all, you have no idea what is going on behind the Instagram posts. Amen? As a pastor, I often get a, a behind-the-scenes view of that Instagram picture. And many times, the marriages look nothing like what you see on social media. Because what you see on social media is posed. Amen? It is posed. It is a set piece. You see what they want you to see. Rarely do people put the truth about their marriages on social media. But those of us who see the back end, not just from our own personal life. And, and let me be clear, I am not talking from the place of perfection. Amen. I'm not talking because I am perfect or because I have done things perfectly. I certainly have not. And when my wife speaks, I'm sure she will point out some of the mistakes that I have made. Amen. But for those of us who are privileged to do life with you and see 
and, and, and do life with, with the congregation. Amen? We see that there are so many good people who are struggling in their marriages. Amen? This verse we have just read tells us two things. Who we should be and who we should be looking for. Who we should be and who we should be with. The fact that you can father a child does not make you a man. The fact that you are making six figures does not make you a man. The fact that you can drink two bottles of honey in one sitting does not make you a man. The problem with the question that I'm asking, the question that I'm asking you to ask is that different societies define a man or a wife in different ways. For example, in many societies, a man is defined as, as a male who can provide for his family. That's what makes you a man, that you can pay the bills. The first question many people ask a guy when he says he wants to marry is, does he have a job? Can he provide? In fact, some women get asked that question when they say, well, I want to marry this guy. The question many people ask them is, well, does he have a job? What does he do for a living? Listen, provision is something a guy does. It is not who he is. And the same goes for a woman. Yes, you are a woman, but are you a wife? You know, in, in, in some societies, we say a woman is wife material. We look at a girl and we say a girl is wife material because she can do certain things, because she can cook, because she, she's good with children. Listen, even I can follow a recipe. Amen? Cooking is something anybody can do. It is not who they are. And we need to stop focusing on what we can do or what he or she can do and focus on who we are, on who they are. Amen? The things that need to be done in marriage, whether it is provision, whether it is chores, they flow from the kind of people in the marriage. You need to focus first on who you are, even before you start to focus on the person that you're looking for. The Bible says that remove the log in your own eye before you start to look for a speck in your brother's eye. That means that your ability to see clearly is defined by how clear you can see yourself. Hallelujah. You need to focus first on who you are. Too many of us have issues. And some of those issues that we have can be very problematic in marriage. Some of us have been through some really traumatic experiences. We have learned to develop coping mechanisms to deal with the difficulties of our upbringing, the difficulties and the challenges of our past. On the outside, we look great. But on the inside, there are serious problems. And some of those coping mechanisms that we have used to protect ourselves, that we have used to comfort ourselves, that we have used to soothe ourselves, are problematic in a marriage relationship. Listen, you can, you can convince, you can trick someone to marrying you. You can flash a bunch of cash. What do you guys call it today? Flexing. You can flash a bunch of cash. You can wear the, the tightest clothes and do all the Instagram challenges perfectly. But after the wedding passes and they meet the real you, it, it's a problem. God wants the person who marries you to look up to heaven and say, thank you, Jesus. Not say, Jesus, why? A man is male that has attained much. So a male, a man is a male that has attained maturity in his thoughts that has ma attained maturity in his thinking, in his heart, on spiritual matters, on, on, on personal matters, on financial matters. A, a wife is a female that has ma attained maturity in, in her heart, in her thinking, on all of these issues. Let us not judge ourselves as to whether we are a man or a wife based on the definition of our communities or societies which changes with the season. It changes with the season, but let us assess ourselves rather based on the word of God. The Bible says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword to the dividing and sunder of soul and spirit. The Bible says that the word of God reveals the intents of a man's heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Bible says something in verse 11. It says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. 
A man, a, a wife, is a mature male, a mature female who has learned to put away childish things. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20 says, Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. Stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. We need to start focusing on the way we think, not just on the way that we look. We spend so much money and so much attention on our physical appearances. We, the, the amount of money we spend on clothes. If only we could spend that on making sure that we are mentally and emotionally mature. In what ways can a person's thoughts or thinking be childish? Let's look at what it means to be childish. Number one, a child will throw a fit if they don't get their way. They, they, they start off by being nice and cute, and when that doesn't work, they will have a full meltdown in the candy aisle at the grocery store. A person who doesn't know how to take no for an answer, who is always trying to push or cross your boundaries, is a problem. Don't be flattered by their persistence. Amen? The truth is that they have no respect or regard for you. And they are more concerned with their pleasure, with getting their way, than with you. We need to be able to read the signs. The things that we call persistence, in the wrong place, persistence can be self-centeredness. Another thing about children, they never accept responsibility. They always want to blame someone else. Have you noticed when you ask a child who did it? You know, they, they point to their sibling. Sometimes they even point to the dog. Dog. Because they just... It is not in their nature to accept responsibility. Maybe it's because they are afraid. I don't know what it is. Beware of a person who will not take responsibility for their mistakes, for their actions. Racism is a problem. But not every problem is because of racism. Sometimes you don't get the promotion because you never show up on time at work or because you never go the extra mile. Sometimes you are a one-man army but that promotion, that raise you want requires a team player and you have never learned to play on a team because maybe you're too selfish to share the glory or maybe you're too impatient to work with others. These are the things we need to look out for. Somebody who can't work with a team. Why? Why can't you get along with other people? If you can't get along with a team, how do you expect that this person who is too impatient to work well with others will be patient with you. It is easier to say everybody hates you than to own up to your issues. In marriage, it is easier to complain that your wife won't sleep with you rather than own up to the fact that, dude, you have no game. It is easier to blame your husband for not having your back rather than owning up to the fact that you are a contentious and cantankerous person. Children, another thing about them is they need to be the center of attention. If you tell a child, I have a car, they will tell you, I have a house. They always have to warn up each other. Beware of the adult who always has to warn up you. Whether it is in your success stories or in your challenges, when you tell a person, oh, I have a headache, and they're like, hmm, I broke my, 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 I broke my leg. That's a problem because they, they struggle with empathy. They need to keep the attention on them because empathy will shift the attention away from them to you. So rather than shifting the attention to you, they will pull it back to them by giving you a, a bigger sub story, so to speak. And they just can't handle that everything is not about them. Children have no impulse control. They have no ability to control themselves. That is why children say the craziest things. But an adult who cannot exercise self-discipline is problematic on multiple levels. When they are angry, they will say and do whatever is on their minds, irrespective of how much pain it causes. And then afterwards, they, 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 they are sorry they said it. And like a child, rather than take responsibility for it, rather than come out and admit that they were wrong and that they are sorry, they will blame you and say it was your fault that I behaved badly. It was your fault that I spoke badly to you. You made me do it. You chose to do it. Nobody made you do anything. Or, or they'll say, well, it's the devil. The devil made me do it. No. 
A mature person makes mistakes, but they own up to their mistakes. They take responsibility for it. Another thing about children is that they are always waiting on somebody to do for them, waiting on somebody to feed them, waiting for their diaper to be changed, waiting to be given a bath. And that's understandable. They, they are helpless. But every time you hear an adult say, I am waiting to get married so I can start eating properly, you want to smack them because you don't need to be married to eat properly. Go to a restaurant if you can afford it or go online and find a recipe and cook for yourself. Amen? It's a problem because this person is not looking for a spouse. They are looking for a chef. The Bible doesn't say a man that finds a cook finds a good thing. It says a man that finds a wife. He who finds a spouse, not he who finds a chef. Or the folks who say, I want to get married so someone, somebody can pay my bills. I'm tired of paying bills. Who isn't tired of paying bills? Dude, who isn't tired of paying bills? You don't need to be married to pay your bills. What you need is a job. Get a job and respect yourself. Because if your paycheck does not cover your lifestyle, then your lifestyle needs to adjust accordingly. Or go get a second job if you must wear Louboutin shoes. It is not the responsibility of another woman's child to keep you in expensive clothing. Go get a certification so you can get a bigger paycheck. A spouse sometimes will come into your life with a second income. But with that second income, they have their own plans for it. Amen? Praise the name of the Lord. In a child, all of these things I have described are irritating. Sometimes they're endearing, they're cute. You know, we expect it, so it's cute. But when you meet an adult who thinks like this, then you know there is a problem. Yes, I know God calls us to be childlike, but that is in our faith. That is when it comes to doing evil, that we are innocent in our minds, but mature. God calls us to maturity in our relationship with others. The Bible is full of verses that tell us to examine ourselves so that others may not come and judge us. Sometimes that self-examination requires us to talk to a friend who will tell us the truth. Listen, if you surround yourself only with cheerleaders, you've got a problem. You need to have people in your life who can open their mouth and tell you exactly as you are. You need to have people in your life who can call you out on your crap. If everybody in your life applauds you and celebrates you, you are surrounded primarily by liars or by people who don't care. I'm, I'm being honest with you. And if you have cut off all the people who tell you the truth from out of your life because you don't like hearing the truth, you're not going to go very far in life. The Bible says that the wounds of a friend, they are, they, they, they are powerful because a friend will hurt you, will tell you things that may be hurtful to improve your life. But an enemy flatters you until you fall into your until you fall to your destruction. Sometimes the self-examination requires us to talk to a professional licensed therapist who will not only tell us the truth, but maybe some things need to be explained to us. Why you do some of the things that you do? Many of us, and I have spoken to many people, married, single, and I realize that. A lot of people do not really know themselves. They don't really know why they do the things that they do. They think that is who they are. And those things are problematic. So they are looking for somebody who is willing to ignore those issues. Who is willing to look past those issues. But can I be honest? The truth is this. We end up investing a lot of energy in hiding them rather than resolving them. Because people don't look past problems. They don't, either they don't see it, or they don't fully appreciate what it is they are seeing. 
Sometimes, in fact, always, self-examination requires us to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to search us, to show us the truth about who we are, and to give us the power to make the change that we need to make. It is just a necessary part of maturity, self-awareness that leads to self-development. This morning, I don't know what your relationship status is, whether you are single, whether you are married, divorced, engaged, talking. I don't know what your relationship status is. But I can tell you this, whatever it is can be better if you will spend some time and examine yourself. Look inwards. Ask the Holy Spirit to search you. What is it about you that needs to change? It is true that nobody is perfect, but there are some imperfections that make marriage extremely combustible and extremely difficult. You can fix it with the power of God. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Let us take a moment and just bow our heads and pray this morning. And just start this morning asking the Lord, before you bring anybody into my life, help me to see the truth about who I really am. And in order to improve my relationship with those who are in my life, help me, Father, to see the truth about who I am. Father, we thank you. Almighty and ever living King, we just bless and praise your name. My Father, my God, we commit each and every one of your children into your hands. Father, there's nothing that is hidden from your sight. You know the thoughts and the intents of every heart. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that by whatever means you choose, either through our friends, through a therapist, or through just our thoughts, you reveal to us the things in us that make relationships difficult for us. That makes our relationships difficult. We thank you, Father. We bless you and we give you praise. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen.